Hey, it is good to have Travis back. So, awesome, man. Awesome, awesome. Amy is home, and uh, she is on the road to recovery here, so it is good to have him back here. So if you don't know that, uh, that is Travis. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jason. That's just a family update there. Welcome to Cornerstone Church. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Um, We're going to get into God's Word here in a moment, but I just want to say a special welcome to those of you that are uh, new to Cornerstone, or maybe you're newer. I hope that you've been welcomed well um, so far today. And uh, really, uh, if you if if you if you're looking for connection, if you haven't yet um, received one of our newer here uh, gift boxes, please pick one up on your way out. We would love to just gift you that. It's our simple way of saying thanks for being with us today. Um, it's got some local goodies in there and some information about the church. So pick up one of those blue boxes. Uh, on your way out if you didn't pick one up. But um, those of you that are choosing church each and every week, welcome back. Um, we're also glad that you're here as well. Um, we have an exciting summer uh, planned for Cornerstone Church. Lots of things that are going on. Um, one of the things that we wanted to highlight, though, and we have mission teams that go out on a regular basis, but we actually, uh, over the next three to four weeks, we have three teams that are going out. And so we just wanted to get those folks before you um, so that you would be praying for them and, uh, and lifting them up. So we've got three teams. Let me just walk through our three teams that are going out. Um, just in a couple of days, we have our Costa Rica team that is leaving to be a part of our ministry that we partner with in San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, reaching impoverished families and kids uh, there in a suburb of, uh, of San Jose. Um, we also have a team that is heading out to Oaxaca, Mexico, a student team. Uh, that will be going to one of the southernmost states of Mexico with one of our newer partners, uh, Foundation for His Ministry. They're going to be working at a children's home with about 60 kids. And also, it's kind of like a mission outpost to indigenous people that live there in the hills and mountains of Oaxaca. And then our third team is a team that's going to Ecuador uh, with Pate Ministries, where they are reaching the coast of Ecuador, uh, primarily through kids' ministry and local outreach And so those teams are going to be going out. The reason that they're going out is because of what we just sang about. Um, Every tribe, tongue, and nation, that's that's what's on God's heart. His heart longs for those individuals. And actually, we know the end of the story that at the end of time, uh, those people are going to be gathered around God's throne. Every nation, tribe, tongue, language represented around God's throne. That's what's going to happen. It's inevitable. But the how we're going to get there is through people taking the good news of Jesus to the nations. And so that's why we go. We are the means by which, we are a meager means, but we are the means by which God is going to do this. And so we're excited to send these teams out. We commission them, and the reason that we commission them and we put them before you is we're trying to follow just an ancient tradition that actually came from a church called the Church in Antioch that we're, we're gonna actually look at today. So this church is the first church to send out the very first missionaries that ever existed for the Christian cause. And they raised up some of their own. The leader said, yep, I think you folks should go. They laid hands on them as a way of blessing them and asking God's protection on them. They prayed for them, and then they were sent. And Antioch served as this kind of launching pad, this diving board into the world. We hope that Cornerstone Church will continue to be that type of church. And so I'm going to pray for our missionaries as they get ready to go over the course of the next uh, three weeks with these three teams, and I'm asking you to pray with me. So let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that these teams have to go and carry the, the, the name of Jesus, the good news that, that Jesus, you came to this earth to, to rescue and redeem people. God, thank you that you have the nations on your heart, and because of that, they're on our heart. God, we pray that in Costa Rica, in Mexico, in Ecuador, God, that you would that you would do an incredible work through your people. God, we know that you have you've called them, you've been equipping them, that they're going to show up and they are going to show out all the things that you have been building in them. And they're gonna, they're gonna advance your causes in those places. So God, we thank you that you've gone before them. We pray, God, that you would continue to use them. We pray that you would keep them safe, that you would help them to grow and help them to accomplish all that you've purposed and planned for them. And we can't wait, Lord, to, to just get back together as a church family and hear the stories of just your activity in the world. God, you're working everywhere all the time. And sometimes we get to hear about those things. And so we just can't wait to hear about your activity in the world through these teams. 
God, we do pray your blessings and your protection on them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying with us. Hey, if you have a copy of God's word, let me invite you to turn to Acts chapter 11. We're going to start a two-week series where we're going to be looking at uh, the church, as I already mentioned, in Antioch. Um, One of the things that I am completely jealous of, and I've been to two of these three locations, um, one of the things I'm absolutely jealous of as these teams are getting ready to get on planes and leave is the food that they're going to participate in. Um, One of the great things about going as a missionary into different cultures, and I love, I absolutely love cultures, but a window into cultures is their cuisine. It's their food oftentimes where you get to sit and you get to hear the stories of these family meals and these traditions that have been prepared over time, and it gives you a glimpse into who they are and and really what they're about. And I know it's wonderful in Mexico and in Ecuador. I was with a missions team in the Czech Republic uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, we were about three hours east of Prague in a little town called Olomots in a Moravian part of the Czech Republic. And while we were there, you know, I was with, I don't know, 20, 25 Americans. Um, our translator, his name is Franta. Franta wanted to make sure that the Americans were taken care of. And so anytime, I don't know if you've experienced this, but as an American, you show up and they said, hey, we want to take you to get good food. And uh, the very first place that they take us is McDonald's. And we're like, no, 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 no. We don't want McDonald's. Actually, we want McDonald's on like day seven or day eight, but we don't want McDonald's day one. We want to eat Czech food. And, and so Franta, our translator, I think night one, he took us to get pizza. And we're like, Franta, man, we want Czech food. We've got pizza. And then the next day he takes us for burgers. And we're like, we don't want burgers. We want Czech food. And so I sat Franta down and I said, Franta, I want authentic Czech food. We, we, man, we want your dishes, your home cooked meals. And he said, I can do that. And so he, he took uh, the small leadership team that I was leading and he took us out to his favorite restaurant and he helped us to order all of his favorite dishes. He even got us the Coke. There's a, there's a knockoff Coke in the Czech, Repu- Czech Republic called Kofala. And so he got us a cup of Kofala. And uh, we got all of our Czech plates and these, I mean, amazing dishes come out on this table. And he's like, this, this is it, guys. Welcome. You have arrived in heaven, you know. And so we sit down and we start diving into these incredible looking dishes. And I have to tell you, it was horrible. <laughs> it it was so, it was, it was some of the worst food I've ever put in my mouth. And I'm looking at my team and they're just like, oh, and we're eating this stuff. And, and here's the thing, I, like I believe this, this, this truth so deeply that if I get authentic food, authentic means good. That's what I thought. I just thought authentic, if it's just authentic Czech food, it has to be good. And it's just, it's bad. It's really, really bad. I felt so bad for Franta. Um, But I believe this lie that if you're getting an authentic thing, the fact of the matter is is that it just started with kind of crummy stuff and crummy ingredients, and you start with these kind of crummy things, and you get an authentic dish of crumminess. That's what you get. Today we're going to talk about, and next week we're going to wrap it up, we're going to talk about what it means to, to be a part of what I'm calling authentic Christianity. And what's interesting is, Some people actually think because they've tasted Christianity, they come away with a taste like I had in the Czech Republic. They've they've tasted Christianity, and they've done that primarily through Christians, and they've gotten a taste, and they're like, this is terrible. I don't like this. I can't stand this. I understand, like, I, I think I understand the ingredients that are in this, but this does not taste good. And I think what's happened is people have had a taste of an inauthentic Christianity. Inauthentic Christianity tastes terrible, just like Czech food. It does. But if you've actually experienced authentic Christianity, because you know what the core ingredients are to being an authentic Christian, if you've tasted that, you've seen that it's good, right? And so that's what we want to talk about today. We're going to talk about actually the church and if you, if you know this, this, is kinda, this might help you at Jeopardy one day, um, where were people first called Christians? It actually happened at the church in Antioch. Notice Acts 11, verse 26. It says it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. This term Christian, little Christ, originated in this town. And I just want to ask us the question, why? Why were they called Christians, and what is the origin of this so that we might be able to get to the 
get back to the authentic nature of Christianity, of what Christians, who they are and what they're supposed to do. Because I don't know about you, I, I, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. I have been for several years. Um, but man, there's stuff that just creeps into my life. And I drift from the authentic kind of pure nature of what I'm supposed to be as a follower of Jesus. I just drift. It's kind of like, I don't know if you, I didn't bring my phone up here, but um, your, does your phone ever get bogged down or your device ever get so bogged down that you have to do that awful thing called a factory reset? To where you're just like, hey, I've tried everything and I've closed everything or whatever, and it's just bogging down. I had to do it with my son's phone the other day, and we're like, we just need to take this thing back to just the operating system. Let's just reset this thing. Some of us in our faith, we just need to get back to the just the basic operating system and say, what are we supposed to be about? Because this world and this culture and just our circumstances, they just, they're just bogging us down. Let's reset and let's go back to this church. So listen to this. This is kind of the context of where this term and Christians were first birthed. Verse 19, it says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. So let me just give you some context here. It says the believers are scattered. There's persecution. There's this man named Stephen that's died. What's, what's happened here is that God had told his people to go. As a matter of fact, uh, God, God told his people to go all the way back, and in, in, in actually Acts 11 is all tied way back to Genesis chapter 1. You see, God created humanity, and when he created mankind in his image, he graciously told them. He didn't just create them and say, good luck. Genesis 127 tells us that God created humanity to bear his image in the world, and then he gave them instructions on what they were supposed to be about. So our first job description is in Genesis 128 which says this, God looked at humanity and he blessed them and he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. That's what you're supposed to be about. And so he says to Adam and Eve and to generations to come, this is what you're supposed to do. Be fruitful, multiply. He says, there's a large world here. And as my image bears, I want my image to go out into all the earth. And the way, one of the ways that you're gonna do that is you're gonna have a lot of kids. He says, multiply, like get going. Um, I just want you to know I have seven kids at home, and so I have taken that command seriously. We're doing our part. I don't know if you're doing your part, but we're trying to get them out there, all right? But he says multiply, and so he wants not just Adam and Eve, but he wants more little Adams and more little Eves so that his image would continue to fill the earth. And so they go, but then he also says, I want you to be fruitful. Fruitfulness is connected to multiplicity, but it also means I want you to to, to do good things. So he sends them into this good world to cultivate, to, to create, to create cultures and to create you know, families and, and towns and villages and all these different things. But we know that as these individuals went out and they bore uh, the image, they didn't bear the image of God, they, they were bearing the imperfect, imperfect, just marred image of fallen Adam and Eve, right? And so as they're going out, they're, they're glimpses of God, but they're marred glimpses of God. But you fast forward all the way to Jesus. Jesus comes and he's the perfect image of God. That's what Colossians chapter one tells us. He's, he's actually the, the perfect image of what it means to bear the image of God. And so he did that for us. And as he's bearing the image of God, he invites other people to be recreated in God's image by seeing who he is as the true image of God and believing on him, we are recreated into the image of, of God in a, in a more perfect way. And as Jesus is leaving the earth, Matthew 28, if you know this term, we, we know it as the Great Commission, uh, Jesus says that all authority in heaven on earth has been given to him. And so then he says to his disciples, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples of all nations. That is a callback to Genesis 128, where he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Jesus says, hey, here's what I want you to do. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Here's what that looks like, recreated images of me. You're gonna go and you're gonna be fruitful and multiply disciples in all nations. That's what I want you to do. And so Jesus, moments before he ascends into heaven, Acts 1.8, he actually gives them the roadmap forward. He says this in Acts 1.8. He says, you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. 
and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, listen to this, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he says, wait until this potency, this power of the spirit comes and then you're gonna go. And what ends up happening is the spirit falls, Acts chapter two, God's people are present in Jerusalem. The spirit, this, this transformation through his powerful spirit happens. They're empowered for the task. Jesus gave them the task, Jerusalem, and then Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And what ends up happening is they receive the spirit and they end up staying in Jerusalem. They end up staying. And so we go from Acts 1.8 to Acts 8.1. And this is what happened. It says a great wave of persecution began that day. What day? It's the day of Stephen's death, the first martyr of Christianity. This individual that was following Jesus, serving Jesus, the, the people in Jerusalem were incited about people that were following Jesus. They threw him in a hole, picked up rocks as big as they could hold over their head, and they threw it on him until he was killed. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And then listen to this. And all the believers, except the apostles, were, notice this word, scattered throughout the regions of where? Judea and Samaria. You see, Jesus said, go, and they said, we want to stay. And then he said, no, for, for realsies, like, go. And persecution came, and they went. Now, I'm not saying that God sent the persecution, but God certainly leaned in and allowed this persecution to take place so that they could do what they were designed to do, go. And they go to Judea, and they go to Samaria. But if you remember Acts 1.8, Jesus' roadmap and game plan, he says, and to the ends of the earth. That hadn't yet happened until we get to Acts chapter 11. And so notice Acts 11 again, verse 19. It says, meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death, they traveled as far as, and here we're starting to get creeping out into the ends of the earth, Phoenicia, which is, if you don't know your, you know, your, the Middle Eastern geography, that's, that's up the road from Judea and Samaria, so a little bit further north, to Cyprus, which is a Mediterranean island. So, I mean, they're, they're at least scattering a little bit more. They're getting on boats, and they're going to distant islands. And then it says they came to Antioch of Syria. And, and the reason I want to draw this out is because we're going to look at Antioch. Antioch is an, a totally different place. It is altogether different than any other place that they've ever been. It is a large city. It's the third largest city in the world at the time. It's roughly the population of, of Atlanta, Georgia today. I, I mean, it's a huge metroplex. It's called the Queen of the East. Um, it, it was, it was, there were crossroads that led north, south, east, and west. It reached Africa and the Middle East and Asia and into Europe. And uh, it was just a, a central hub for trade and culture and also sinfulness. It, it, was, it was a detestable city. Um, if, you, if you know anything about Rome, at least from like shows maybe that you've watched, like you know the ethics of Rome, right? We all kind of glimpse and get, have some guess as far as like what the morals and the ethics were of Rome, right? And you're just like, man, there was some detestable stuff going on there. It was nothing like Antioch. As a matter of fact, the people in Rome they used to say of Antioch, they said, the sewage of Antioch flows all the way to Rome. They're like, keep your morals and all of your grossness over there. And you're like, you're Rome. <laughs> like, who are you to talk? And they're like, ah, but we're not Antioch. And the reason that I want to highlight that is because it's in this morally detestable, large metroplex that God's light is going to shine brightest. It's, it's pretty incredible, just the hope that we have as our world and maybe even our culture, you see it getting darker and darker and darker. And I think God's up in heaven, he's going, here it comes. The, the light is gonna shine so bright in this particular moment. And so they go, but listen, verse 19, it says that as they were going, they preached the word of God, but only to Jews. But then there's a change that happens in verse 20, and I want to read verses 20 through 26 for you. There's this rescue word. It's the word however, verse 20. He says, however, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. And look what happens. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed 
and turned to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard about what happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching the large crowds of people. And it was at Antioch the believers were first called Christians. Why are they first called Christians? What are some things that clue us into the key ingredients to authentic Christianity that we see birth at the church in Antioch? Number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to notice this. First of all, these early Christians had a passion to share the gospel. They had a passion to share the gospel. You may have noticed in verse 19 where it says, there's a group of people that go up and they were speaking only to Jews. What that meant is they were talking to people that looked only like them talked only their language, went to uh, the synagogues that they were very familiar with, which it was fine to take it to people that you're familiar with, but there's this much larger audience. And so there's a group of people in Antioch and the majority of the population, roughly half a million people in Antioch, they're not Jewish. Here it calls them um, Gentiles. All that means is the non-Jewish individuals, the majority of this community. In verse 20, again, it says, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyprus, remember, that's a Mediterranean island. Cyrene is on the coast of modern-day Libya. So people from Africa, people from the Mediterranean uh, island of, of Cyprus, they take the gospel to the Gentiles, and they're speaking to people about the Lord Jesus. One thing that I want you to notice about these people that are passionate about the gospel that launched this incredible church that will stand as one of the, one of the greatest churches in 2,000 years of church history. It says that some of the believers, not one of them is named. I just think that's so fascinating. There are so many things that happen in the New Testament, in particular in Acts, as God is on the move in his world, and it's just unnamed ordinary people. That's who God typically uses. I hope that you know that. It's just unnamed, ordinary people that are just doing ordinary things, living the life of a Jesus follower in their context. That's what these people are doing. They move in this town of Antioch, and they're looking around, and they're not asking who has received the gospel yet. They're looking around, and they're like, who has yet to hear? Let's go to them. I don't know if you know this, but there are so many people in in lots of churches, and Cornerstone is no exception. There are lots of people that are doing ministry in their every day, and you never hear about it. I mean, just incredible things. God is always working. He's certainly always working through his people, and yet we rarely hear about it. I actually heard a story uh, about a week and a half ago. We were sitting around as a staff, and I heard about this couple, and you, you, you may actually be here. And so I, just unnamed ordinary people, I'm not even going to say a name, but there's a, I heard a story of a couple that met someone through our food pantry. It was a disabled gentleman. Uh, they were delivering groceries, and he expressed an interest in coming to church, but he's, he's, he's in a wheelchair, severely disabled, and he can't come to church. And so what they did three years ago is they would come into town, um, and the wife would drop the husband off uh, a couple of blocks down the road this way, and he would get him uh, in his wheelchair, and he would push him down this sidewalk right here, several blocks, and they come into this church every single day for three years. And wheel him in, worship together, wheel him back home, um, have lunch with him on a Sunday afternoon, meet needs throughout the week, all of these things. And they're just unnamed, ordinary people that are living the life of a Jesus follower. And I I, I like, that, that seems like a holy story to me. I heard that and I was like, oh my goodness, that is incredible. And my first thought is, we just need to share that story and let's get them on video and let's do this. They don't want that. But that's, that's what followers of Jesus do, and that's the way that his causes advance in the world. It's just unnamed ordinary people that are advancing his causes in just simple ways, looking around and saying, what can I do? And that's what these individuals did. And it says again in verse 20 that they were preaching the Lord Jesus. And this is what happened. Notice verse 21. It says, the power of the Lord was with them, 
and a large number of these Gentiles, notice these words, they believed and they turned to the Lord. They believed and turned to the Lord. He, he's, he's kind of separating out these two things. So they go, and their simple message is, believe on the Lord Jesus. Really interesting language that kind of gets lost on us. The word Lord in the Greek is the word kurios, and it was a word that was used to talk about Caesar. He was kurios. It was kurios Caesar. He was the Lord. He was the one that was going to save all of the Roman Empire. And so when they come and they say, hey, we want to tell you about the kurios, but he's like the real kurios. It's the kurios Christos. It's, it's Jesus as this Lord. The one that can truly save you is not this political figure. It is this Jewish carpenter who came back to life. And so they come and they share the good news of this good Lord, this Savior that can save you. And it says that a number of people in hearing this, they believed and they turned. Listen, these are critical steps when we're sharing the gospel, critical steps to respond to the gospel, is that you have to believe and you have to turn. So in order to believe, it's just assume that these people have heard, right? And we know that they were, they were talking to a whole lot of people about the Lord Jesus. And some people that heard about the Lord Jesus, like their life was heading in this direction. They were pursuing the Lord of whatever it was, of Caesar, of self, of whatever it was. They were heading in this direction and they were stopped in their tracks because of the hearing of the good news of Jesus. They believed, they said yes, they nodded their head and they said, yes, I believe this good news. I believe that he actually, in fact, may be the Lord. They believed it. And then it says these individuals then turned and they followed Jesus. They went in a different direction than what they were going. That's what it is to follow Jesus. You know, in James chapter two, it tells us that the demons, they even believe, right? They don't worship Jesus as Lord, but they certainly believe that Jesus is Lord because they haven't turned as if they could, but, but we can. It's really interesting. Um, I mentioned Franta. Remember terrible food Franta in the Czech Republic? Um, so we were there, and the entire week we were sharing the gospel out in these little these little villages in these little parks. And so I'm out there with Fran- in, with Franta, and um, he's translating. And so we're doing different clubs and different things. And then we would gather the kids, we'd gather the, gather the adults around. Um, we were actually using frisbees that had the gospel uh, presented in Czech. And so we would go out and we'd play frisbee with kids. I remember there was this one dad, and just think like Eastern European dude, just like gruff like the perpetual cigarette hanging out of his mouth with about that much ash on it, you know? And he's just like looking at us like we're weirdos, which we were. And, um, and he's just, and, and I, I was trying to get him, like my goal that whole week was like, hey, throw the Frisbee, man. I throw it at his feet and he's just like, no, you know? And then like day two, he picked it up and he threw it to me, but it was upside down because they had never seen Frisbees and he threw it and it just like, you know, and I was like, no, no, let me show you. And like day five, he's just like, ah, you know? Hey, you know, it was awesome. And he was one of the guys that was sitting around during the week as we're presenting the gospel. And so I'm, I'm sharing in bits, you know, through this translator. And Frantis, he, he's emphatically translating as we're inviting people to life in Christ. And, and what ends up happening is um, we, we just had a great time. At the end of our week, I mean, last day, Steve, our missionary, he goes, hey, how's it going with Franta? And I said, man, besides the food, like, couldn't be better He's great, man. And Steve goes, that's so good. He goes, "Um, because Franta is not a believer. And I was just curious how the translation was going to go. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, I don't know, man. He's he's translating, and I I hope he's saying what he's supposed to be saying. He's just like, turn to Satan. And I was like, I have no idea. It's in check. But he's translating, and he's doing it well. People are responding to the gospel. I don't know. And Steve's like, man, that's so good. I'm hoping that like, like Frontus hearing through this, it had never crossed my mind. I assumed that this guy was a believer. Um, what's really cool is a week later, we get home and I get an email from Steve. And he said, Jason, I just wanted to follow up with you and wanted to celebrate with you and your team. Franta this week gave his life to Jesus. And this next week, yeah, you can clap for that. And he said, this, this, this past week, uh, Franta not only confessed Jesus as Lord, uh, but he got in the waters of baptism, and he sent me pictures of Franta being baptized. 
And, and, and here, here's why I share that story is that Franta, unbeknownst to me, he's in this moment where he's just hearing the good news of Jesus and he's hearing it over and over and over again. And there's a moment, I don't even know when it happens. No clue I'm sharing, assuming that he knows it, but he hears it and he believes. And then just days later after we left, he makes this pivot and he turns his life over to Jesus and starts walking in this way. One of the ways, one of the markers that you've turned and you've started walking this way is this tub. It's, it's baptism. It's saying, yes, I identify with Jesus. Jesus identified with me and I identify with him. By the way, we're going to baptize somebody in the next service, which is really awesome. Who's going on a mission trip too. Um, so they leave on Wednesday and they're getting baptized today. It's awesome. The early believers, if you're looking at critical ingredients to what it means to be a follower of Jesus, they're passionate about sharing the gospel. Number two, not only are they passionate about the gospel, but number two, they have a humility among their leaders. There's a culture of humility that is birthed out of their leadership. Notice this, it says in verse 22, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So the, the church in Jerusalem is, is the church. Like that is, that's, that's the broadcast church. That's the hub. Everything is going out because the apostles are based there. Remember, they're the ones that stay. And so what they do is they hear that the gospel is going out in a unique way in this metropolis, and they send Barnabas. Why did they send Barnabas? I have no idea. Um, part of me wants to think that they were skeptical. You know, they're trying to keep tight reins on what this thing is. They're doing something new, and they're like, hey, Barney, uh, why don't you go up there, man? Go figure out what in the world is going on. That, that could have been some of it. Maybe it was optimism. Maybe they're going up, and they're going, God's going to doing a new work. Let's go. I know religious people, and so I tend to think it's more skepticism than optimism. But they sent the right guy. Barnabas, we're introduced to him in Acts chapter 4. His name means son of encouragement, and that's exactly who he is. Notice what happens in verse 23. It says, when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. And then listen to the characteristics of this man. It says, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in the faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. I just want you to notice what this man does and why he does it. It says that he is a good man. By the way, if you're, if you're looking at characteristics for leaders in the church in particular, this is a great list. We're, we're actually looking at some, at, at, at expanding our team right now as a church. I've been studying this. I've been interviewing people. And I'm looking at Acts 11, 24, and I'm going, good dude, full of the Holy Spirit, strong in faith. Yeah, th those, those are good characteristics to look for. And here's what happened. The fruit of Barnabas, this being his character, I just want you to notice this, verse 23. It says, when he arrived, he saw the evidence of God's blessing. There are people in the church, leaders in particular, that should be able to look out and just see God's grace and rejoice in it. Because God just does things that we don't anticipate that he's going to do. He saves people that we're like, man, they're so far gone, there is no way. And he shows up and he sees that he sees this evidence of God's blessing, that God's doing something that he shouldn't be doing here, but it's God and he's doing it. And notice what happens. It says, and he was filled with joy. Like religious people, legalists, when they go and they see God blessing some work over there, they get really, really angry because it's not their church and it's not through them. And they just go, ah, oh, man, whatever, that church, blah, 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 blah. They're probably selling themselves out, this and this and whatever, you know. It's funny, people used to challenge, if you know the name D.L. Moody, they used to just challenge him and rail against him. And he's like, ah, you're wadding down the gospel and you know this and this, and these people aren't really converted and this and this. And he said, I, I like my way of sharing the gospel more than your way of not sharing the gospel. I'll just leave it at that. I'm just sharing and you're not, and here's the fruit. And he's encouraged and he encourages also. It says he encouraged the believers to stay true. That's what he did. He was encouraging. I want you to see this, this guy kind of as a template of what we're supposed to be about as leaders, but just as a church body. There's a humbleness to him. There's a curiosity and a leaning into, God, where are you, where are you at work? What's, what's going on here, God? Where do you, we see your grace? 
And where can I have joy in the fact that you're working? And I'm gonna encourage this all the more. We need encouragement. We need humility. We need curiosity. We need encouragement. I, I hope that you have somebody that is an encourager to you. Like we, we all, I'm sure that you have discouragers in your life, right? You got that guy, you're walking down the hall in, in the office and he's coming to the water cooler same time as you and you go, oh, no, no, I'll get water later, you know? And you're just like, I just don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna get discouraged. But you also know there's encouraging people as well, right? You see them get up to go to the water cooler and you're just like, I guess I need water now, you know, and you're going over. I had a guy in my life for years, his name's Dave Dawson out in Washington. And I loved meeting with Dave. And to be completely honest and to be completely selfish, I love Dave because Dave loved me. Like I was in meetings with Dave and Dave was like, you know what, Jason? That's a great idea. And I was like, really? I, I think that's a horrible idea. He's like, it's a great idea. And I think you should do it. And I was like, all right, man. And I like went and I, I did all kinds of things. And one of the reasons, one of the key ingredients for me to have accomplished things for the kingdom here on earth is because of people like Dave. Just encouragement. Like none of us walked into this room just over the top encourager. Like if one more person encourages me, I just, you know. What, what if we were a church that was humble, that was curious, and we were committed to encouraging one another to continue on? The third and final thing that I want you to notice is this, is that they had a conviction to make disciples. They had a conviction to make disciples. They were seeing converts, and they were so thrilled to see people believe and turn to the Lord Jesus, but they weren't, they weren't stopping there at that turning. They wanted people to be growing up in their faith. And notice what happens. Verse 25, it says, then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. Just side note here. Saul is the man, you remember back in Acts 8, 1, the believers are scattered because of the persecution. If you don't know this, that persecution, at the head of that persecution was a man named Saul. He's the one that it says held the jackets of the individuals that picked up those large stones and dropped them on Stephen's head until he died. Saul was the one that orchestrated and oversaw that, Acts 8.1. And God in this incredible way redeems that man holding those coats, overseeing that persecution that would scatter these people. Barnabas goes and he goes, you know who I really need? I need the redeemed murderer. I need the guy that's been out in Tarsus, has been studying out in the desert, Galatians tells us, that is connecting this ancient faith and this ancient tradition to the reality that we're sitting in, that Jesus is Kyrios, he's Lord, and I need him now. And so he goes and he brings him back to Antioch. Verse 26, when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. What they understood is that they needed these people to grow up. Here's another just kind of humble moment for Barnabas. Like Barnabas is the man. He came from the church in Jerusalem, like Peter. Like we all know Peter, like Jesus's right-hand dude. Peter says to Barnabas, hey, man, I want you to go up here and do this. Barnabas shows up and he's like, hey, I don't know if you guys know this, but you know Peter, you know, who knew Jesus really well? He sent me and he's gonna tell me, you know, I'm in charge now. And Barnabas very quickly, he goes, hey, I need, I need something more than me. I need something that's different than me. And so Barnabas demotes himself. He goes and he gets this man, Saul. By the way, if you don't know, he later changes his name to Paul. So we're talking about Paul here, right? He goes and he gets him and he goes, hey, I, we need a teacher. And can, man, can we just set up camp here for 12 months? Can we just teach these people? They need to grow up in this faith and I can't think of anyone better And what ends up happening over the next couple chapters, you can see, is that Barnabas and Saul are working together. Barnabas puts Saul, who would become Paul, in front of him. And what's crazy is Barnabas and Saul, you watch it change in Acts, it becomes Paul and Barnabas. And then it eventually becomes just Paul, and and Paul goes, hey, Barnabas, you're, you're a wimp. You need to get out of here, man. I'm going on on my own. And just Barnabas is no more. And that all happened because Barnabas said, you know what? He must increase, I must decrease, I must find capable people to come and teach these individuals, and I need to sidestep this. That's what leaders do. 
and he teaches them. And, and I, I just want to note this. It's, they're teaching for a full year. Discipleship takes time. Growing up in your faith takes time. It takes intentionality. We, we need good teachers, good leaders that are out kind of setting the pace and showing us which way we need to go. And so we need to have good leaders out there to follow. We need to follow them for a good long while. One of the things that breaks my heart is when people jump from church to church to church to church because you need to be settled somewhere in order to grow. And if you're looking for a church or maybe you haven't yet settled here, um, I just want you to know we would count it a, 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 a tremendous privilege and honor for you to just camp out here for a season so that we can get to know you, you can get to know us. We can introduce you to some leaders that are gonna help you grow in your own personal discipleship journey. It just takes time. You gotta settle somewhere for a season. And so if you're looking to settle somewhere for a season, we take discipleship very seriously. We want you to grow in your faith. And I believe if you land here, you will grow here. And so we would count it a tremendous privilege if you would land here so that we can help grow you up in faith. But it takes time. So these believers, just if you're thinking about what's, what's the secret sauce, what's the recipe to this authentic Christianity, they've got a passion to share Jesus. They've got a humility and an encouragement that just kind of is a part of their culture, and they've got this conviction to grow. The fruit of this church we're going to look at next week, but one thing that I want to mention as we close is just this amazing story that comes, and it's not found in Acts chapter 11. It's actually not found in the Bible. It's found coming from the mouth of Caesar, who thought he was Lord. It's written by a historian, and he wrote about the church in Antioch. What ended up happening is on the heels of this church being birthed, there were two major plagues that hit the city of Antioch. Lives were lost. I mean, tens of thousands of lives were lost. This plague was wreaking havoc. And one of the things that happened is if, if children in the home, babies in particular, contracted this plague, what they would do is a regular practice was they would take these, these children that were infected, they would take them outside of the city and they'd throw them on the trash heap so that they would die by what's called exposure. And something very famous happened in the town of Antioch. There was this new group of people that people were calling Christians, little Christ, that would go out on a regular basis to the trash heaps. And they would listen for the cries of infected children, and they would take them into their own arms, and they would take them into their homes. And they would either nurture them back into health, or they would be alongside them until they passed. I just want, I want you to know, and, and this sounds like such an incredible thing, many of these Christians that took these kids in, they lost their own lives as well. Like we're not protected when we go out and we risk and we do and all of these things. There's hurt and there's even loss that happens when we step out on mission in faith. But the reason that we know that this happened actually comes from a historian who was quoting Caesar who said this of the Christians in Antioch, quote, these godless people, godless because they didn't worship all of the Roman gods, they only worshiped one God. These godless people take care of their own poor and dying as well as our own. See, people don't normally do that. what, What natural, normal, broken image bearers do is they look out for themselves and they even toss kids on the trash heap. But you know what redeemed image bearers do is they go out at the risk of their own lives and they go and they rescue. That's just a glimpse of what it means to be a little Christ. A Christian is what that term is. To give it all, even our very lives for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of dignity and value and worth of every image bearer. That's what we do. Friends, my challenge for you as as we close and and as we get to celebrate and sing about the Lord Jesus again here, my challenge is is that would you just consider a reset maybe today? A reset of getting back to just just a pure and simple understanding of what we're supposed to be about. Those, Those early ingredients of just being passionate about looking around and just saying, who hasn't yet heard the good news of Jesus? Can I start having conversations towards that? Can I do that in humble and and curious and 
in encouraging ways amongst my work and the work of the church? And, and can I just get back to growing? Instead of trying to be a Christian, let, let's train to be Christians. We don't, we don't try to do hard things in this world. If I, if I tried to run a marathon, it would be horrible. But I can train to run a marathon if that's what I want to accomplish. Quit trying to be a Christian and train to be a Christian. Let's reset together and let's do that. Let's, let's pray. Father, we come to you and we, we just humbly acknowledge just, just our need for you. We, we want, many of us in this room, we want, we want to represent you well. And even as we're talking about getting back to just the core of who we are, we long to return to that. And so God, I pray that you would help us to do that in, in ways that we're able to wake up tomorrow and take on that challenge and move towards that in ways of embodying and sharing our faith and humble and courageous ways as we encourage one another in convictional ways as we seek to grow as followers of you. And I especially pray today for those that are, maybe they're like Franta. They've just been around the gospel. They've heard about the Lord Jesus, but they've never truly believed in the sense that where they are now, they haven't yet turned. And God, I, I just pray for a turning today, maybe for folks that are hearing, of acknowledging Jesus as Lord. God, thank you for moments like this. Thank you for your word and the power of it. God, we continue to celebrate your work among us. God, we celebrate the fact that one of our brothers is gonna be baptized here in the next uh, hour or so. We're sending teams out in all the world. We're, we're, we're trying. We're getting back to the core of what you've designed us to do. And so God, I pray that you would help us to do that in powerful and effective ways. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.